Friday, Defence Minister, the Prime Minister launched the 2013 Defence White Paper, the sequel to 2009. Yeah. You were at the Red Carpet premiere, what did you think? Well it was a chilly morning in Canberra but it was a pretty good launch actually. Uh, Australia seems to be doing these Defence White Paper launches with a bit of American style pomp these days. Uh, I was at the one in 2009 where Kevin and Rudd kicked off his White Paper on the back of a frigate. This time round it was uh, in a hangar surrounded by aircraft. Uh, there was a, a Super Hornet over to one side, a C-17 where the press conference was held. It was a surprisingly uh, good launch, a surprisingly uh, solid script, if you like. If this is a movie, uh, it's actually a sequel that's better than the original. But no one was really expecting a blockbuster this time. I mean, our, our expectations were pretty low. We didn't really think that there'd be all that much meat in this white paper, but I've been pleasantly surprised. There's a clear shift in, in the way that the, uh, the white paper writing team has assessed the region that Australia's in. Well, I was pleasantly surprised too. I thought that the hand of various senior officials was pretty obvious in the drafting of this thing. It was a sophisticated strategic analysis and in many ways that was the strong part. The weak part is still the budget, if you like. I mean, this uh, should be a movie made on a big budget, but at the moment we just don't know how much it's going to cost. But and we know how much everybody would like to spend, yeah, well, which is 2% roughly magical of GDP, spend, yeah. which uh, seems to have been unanimous amongst the Prime Minister, the Defence Minister, former Defence Ministers and, the and future Defence yeah. Ministers as well. Well, maybe. Um, <laughs> possibly. Uh, but 2% uh, is still leaving the Defence Force underfunded by about $7.5 billion, and no one's really yet made it clear what sort of risks we're incurring whilst we leave defence underfunded to that extent. Um, there was a promising sign that there will be a slight budget boost uh, in the budget in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, there was some money allocated to purchases like an additional 12 growlers. Uh, but still there's a lot of question marks. This white paper we will promise a defence funding model uh, that would react to the adversity of the global financial crisis, but there's only 700 words in a 132 page document, so not quite what we're expecting there. No, and I agree with you on all of that. I think that um, we were hoping that the Prime Minister would address some of this in her script, if you like, at the, uh, the launch of the White Paper, but really we were given assurances that the government will try and move back towards 2% uh, of GDP. The opposition has promised the same. There almost seems to be a, um, a gentleman's agreement between the two sides that they won't push that topic too hard. And in the meantime, those of us who are concerned about Australian defence policy are left wondering how is the government or a future government going to get the Australian Defence Force back to the level of spending it needs to do all the things that the White Paper says it should do. And the White Paper does lay out a pretty sensible set of missions, a pretty sensible structure for Australian defence policy in terms of uh, challenges and objectives. It's just that um, we're still a bit in the dark as to how we're going to get there. And in this uh, White Paper there are the big stars, the big ticket purchases. So we've got a promise of Joint strike fighters still to come. Uh, we've got now a mixed fleet. We're going to get new Armadale patrol class, uh, patrol boat class replacements. We're going yep. to see uh, the new amphibious ships. Uh, we're going to see the new air warfare destroyers all coming down the track. But what's missing, I think, really in the, the modernisation of the Defence Force is the sort of deeper production values. So uh, what kind of infrastructure and basing we're going to see around the country? Uh, what kind of logistic systems will underpin these big new purchases? Um, how we will deliver fuel in Northern Australia, for example. So there's a lot of those questions still to be asked. It kind of feels like a work that's kind of halfway there, but not quite fully convincing me that there's going to be a modern defence force ready to face the challenges of the Asian century. Well, I, saw, I see this white paper as, in some ways, a, a good corrective to the 2009 white paper, which uh, promised a lot. It kind of spoke loudly, but ended up carrying a pretty small stick to use a, um, uh, a sort of a reverse definition of what good statesmanship should be all about. But at the same time, we're still left wondering what will the next white paper look like? I think this is kind of part two of a trilogy of films. And um, I suspect that the, uh, the best is going to have to be yet to come, whether it's from uh, one particular director or another. And I think you're right, a lot of the, and very nicely done with that little director references, yeah. that was uh, beautiful. But uh, I think you're right, we're still 
not quite where we need to be as far as developing a military strategy for new and uncertain times. A lot of the references to what the ADF will do are still under the old model, talking about uh, deterring and defeating lodgements in the archipelago around Australia. Uh, the principal tasks for the ADF are still the same. Um, so you're right, I think there's still a way to go and this is only the second part of a trilogy. With that in mind, reviewing the white paper in its entirety, what would you give it out of five stars? Look, if this was a movie, I'd give it probably three and a half, uh, but I really want to know how much it costs. And when I find that out, it'll be either a, a two or a five. A two or a five. All right, I'm going to give it about two and a half just to split the difference.